Father, thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for opportunities to teach and opportunities to learn. We do both by your spirit. May that happen today. In Jesus' name, amen. The diamond of salvation, the third facet in the diamond of salvation is glorification. And I have been so blessed preparing this stuff that uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do it. One of my favorite things is seeing Broadway musicals with Catherine, whether it's in Toronto or London or New York or wherever we've seen those. But Jerome Kearns and Oscar Hammerstein's Broadway musical Showboat is a very famous one. It follows the lives of the performers, the stagehands, and the dock workers on the Cotton Blossom. The Cotton Blossom is a Mississippi River showboat. And the central song on Showboat in this musical is a very famous one, and it is called Old Man River. Old Man River keeps on rolling along. Would you like to hear me sing it this morning? Yes. No. <laughs> I heard one voice over here. <laughs> but Old Man River is a very, very famous song, and there's one line in that song that represents the fears of so many human beings. And it's a very legitimate fear. It says this, tired of living and scared of dying. Doesn't that kind of wrap up what most people in our world feel about dying? Tired of living and scared of dying. The third facet in the diamond of salvation is glorification which is all about the wonders, the magnificent blessings, and the security of heaven. It addresses that song that we just talked about. If we're honest, there are times in all of our lives when the cares of life pile up, but we're scared of dying, even as Christians, because of our low level of confidence in heaven and that it is our final destination, and really, what is it? I pray the Lord increases our confidence in heaven through this class. Well, the question is, what are some of the modern concepts of heaven in our society? Uh, we've all seen the Philadelphia cream cheese ads on TV in which angels are dressed in white togas, strumming harps, floating on clouds, and eating Philadelphia cream cheese in heaven. We've all seen that, haven't we? Well, let me tell you something. That is not heaven. If heaven is, in fact, eternally sitting on clouds playing harps, most of us will take a pass on heaven. We're not interested. Thank you very much. Fortunately, this is not the biblical view of heaven. C.S. Lewis talks about it and, and does it very eloquently when he says this. All the scriptural imagery, okay, such as harps, crowns, and gold, is merely a symbolic attempt, merely symbolism, symbolic attempt to express the inexpressible. It is a symbol to try to describe for us what otherwise can't be put into language. He goes on to say... People who take these symbols literally might as well think that when Christ told us to be like doves, he meant that we were to lay eggs. I like that. No, we're not meant to lay eggs. So we don't take this literally. It is symbolism expressing what is otherwise inexpressible. And that becomes an important starting point. Justification refers to our, our past experience of salvation. We have been saved, hopefully. All of you can say that. When we experience God's magnificent work of justification. Sanctification refers to our present experience, as we said. It's the here and now. We are being saved when we are allowing God's magnificent work of sanctification to take place in our lives. As I said last week, this is a process. In other words, it is going on daily as we cooperate. And I don't think it's finished until we get to heaven. 
Some other theologians may disagree with me on that, but I just haven't seen any perfect people in this life. Glorification refers to our future experience of salvation. We will be saved. We will be saved when we reach heaven, and God's magnificent work of sanctification will be complete. We'll be morally and spiritually perfect forever. Don't you look forward to that day? The Bible recognizes the importance of heaven because 54 out of its 66 books refer to heaven. That's pretty good. Pretty high number. 54 out of the 66 books in the scriptures refer to heaven, showing its importance. Well, 1 Peter 1 and 3 summarizes our hope of heaven. It kind of encapsulates it or brings it together in an expression in this way. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope, that's heaven, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I love that. He's given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, so what are some of the key ideas in this verse? Well, number one, our hope of heaven is a living hope. I like that. It's a living hope. It's not something that's dead. It's not something that is on life support. It is not something that is in question. It is not a mere possibility. It is a living hope. And that's your hope, and that is my hope. Secondly, goes on to say, this hope is based on the certainty of the resurrection of Christ. And as we all know from being here at Broadway Church and, and studying the resurrection at Easter time, the resurrection is the most significant event in all of history. Nothing is more significant. And because the resurrection has been proven to be an absolute historical certainty, and that's important, it is an absolute historical certainty in which Christ rose from the dead. It's not just an apparition that happened. Our living hope or our experience of glorification in heaven is just as certain an absolute historical event in the future. And that is beautiful. You can hold on to that. If the resurrection is true, we read in Scripture, so is your future resurrection in going to heaven in glorification. First Corinthians 15 and 20, Paul puts it this way. He says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And I, I, I like that expression, first fruits. We can understand it because of the, pro, the province in which we live in, British Columbia. The quality of this experience of glorification for the Christ follower is compared to a fruit harvest in a place like the Okanagan, where the quality of the entire apple harvest can be predicted at the beginning with its first fruits. With the first apples that come in, people, people can tell generally what the entire harvest is going to be like. Well, based on this analogy, and it's, an, it's a neat analogy, since Christ ascended to the glories of heaven after his death and resurrection, then heaven will be our final postal code. The first fruits have shown that, have demonstrated it in the resurrection of Christ. The Christ follower begins to experience also a taste of heaven, a taste of heaven on this earth through reading the word, and through worship. When we are in a worship experience and there's the sense of the Lord's presence, that's the beginning of heaven. And that is the wonderful truth in that we are getting a taste, a sample of that. Um, I, I enjoy going to the craft show with Catherine, and we just did that a, couple, a week or so ago. And there at the craft show, they give out little samples of the certain foods they have, and yeah, I'm prone to take more than one sample, <laughs> if I can. But there are samples of them and demonstrate what the food is. 
we, we recognize that there's this taste of heaven on this earth. C.S. Lewis uh, phrases it wonderfully when he says this. Heaven enters whenever Christ enters, even in this life. I like that. Heaven enters whenever Christ enters, even in this life. You probably have had experiences like that. I had an experience of this in a very special way at the conclusion of my mother's funeral. It was a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago. She was a godly woman who had a vibrant experience, a, a, a very simple faith in Jesus. We never talked about complicated theological issues. Uh, I did that with my father. But my mother had a wonderful, simple faith, went to be with the Lord at age 95, and um, as I was walking out of the church, Church on the Queensway in Toronto, hearing the congregation sing, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. And the tears welled up in my eyes as I held Catherine's hand, as the wonderful hope of heaven struck me in such a personal way. I was experiencing a taste of heaven. I will see you again, Mom. Well, a definition of heaven, number one, it is a real place. It is not just a state of mind. And that, that's important. It is a real place, not just a state of mind. It is the dwelling place of God and sheer God. Goodness, everything that's goodness is represented there, and those closely associated with God after death. Paul says Christ followers have, quote, a building, have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Number three, C. It is the place of perfection where God's will is perfectly done. I try to do the Lord's will on this earth, but I never do it perfectly. Mm. <laughs> yes, I do mess up. And so do you, I believe. But this is a wonderful truth about heaven. It is the place where, of perfection, where God's will is perfectly, totally done. Number D, it, where there is neither the presence nor even the possibility of sin, sickness, and death. Wow. What, what a marvelous thing to eradicate those three trios from our life. Sin, sickness, and death, all totally removed. And number four, uh, it, is, it is a place, as I said, where sin, tears, death, and mourning or pain are also eliminated. The next one is really important. I want to stress it, want to underline it, want to focus on it. Because I appreciate the church we are in, Broadway. I appreciate the multicultural aspect of this church. I'm not just blowing smoke here. I appreciate the fact that we have all countries of the world represented here. And heaven is a multicultural place with people of all races, languages, and colors. I tell people, and I've said this to them before, if you don't like a multicultural expression of faith, you're going to hate heaven. And I really do believe that. So scripturally, where do I get that, Jim? Back it up with scripture. Galatians 3.28, Paul says this. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Revelation 7.9 is powerful. John describes his vision of heaven in these words. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Wow, folk, if that's not multicultural, I don't know what is. And that's the wonderful expression of what heaven will be. And here, here's a neat one that I want to explore. And uh, I, I think there's been some confusion on this one. Under a definition of heaven, it is a place where Christ followers receive their rewards for faithful service on earth. Faithful service on earth is important. 
It's not trivial that you serve the Lord here. You're not earning your salvation, but you are earning a reward. Okay, let's distinguish between the two and let's figure that out. Christ followers receive their rewards for faithful service on earth. Matthew 5 and 12. Jesus is speaking to his persecuted followers and he says this. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Salvation is the entry point and then the rewards that come after that. Every true Christ follower gains entry into heaven, but there are different levels of rewards. As speaking of heaven, 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, believer, the believer's work, quote, will be shown for what it is because the day, that is referring to the assessment day in heaven, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and fire will test. And here's the important thing, the quality of each man's or believers work and the key word there is quality now let me just park there for a moment for example and and you've probably all heard of Chuck Swindoll I love his writing love his preaching and he elaborates on this idea of the rewards in heaven and Chuck Swindoll says this all rewards in heaven will be based on quality not quantity now that's very very important because if rewards are only based on quantity, then people like Chuck Swindoll, who used to pastor a church of 5,000, will be getting some great rewards, and those who have no opportunity to pastor anything will hardly get any. That's very, very important. The rewards are based on quality of our service, the intent that we have to serve the Lord, the willingness to serve the Lord in the area that we are called to do. Maybe you're not called to be a pastor. Don't get upset about that. There, may there be quality service in the area in which you are called. Swindoll goes on to say, God's eye is always on motive. When he rewards servants, it will be based on quality, which means everyone has an equal opportunity to receive a reward. I like that. Everyone here today, right now, has an opportunity to store up a reward in heaven. And he goes on to say, no reward that is post for postponed will be forgotten because God's memory is perfect not like our memory and especially Jim's memory, okay? God's memory is perfect and every work we do will be rewarded based on quality. So serve the Lord, serve the Lord well in the place in which you are called. Lawrence Richards puts it well when he says this, no, rel no relative of mine, Scripture itself tells us that human beings are not mere sparks that grow in the dark and then are gone, that glow in the dark and then are gone. That, 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 that's what some people teach, don't they, in our secular world, that we're just like a spark and we, we fly through a second through, through the universe and then we're gone. No, Scripture teaches that human beings are not mere sparks that glow in the dark and then are gone. God's gift of life in man, investing in us his own likeness and image, made us more than the animals. We are too significant to disappear, although we have never been. I like that. Because we are God's creation, especially in the image of God, unlike any other animal, we are too significant to disappear, as though we have never been unlike God, in other words, unlike God in that we have a beginning, in other words, God didn't have a beginning, so we're unlike him in this way, we are like God in that once we are born, we have no end. I like, I like this. We're unlike God in that he didn't have a beginning and we do. We are like God in that we have no end, just like him. Ecclesiastes 3.11 is a great verse when it says this, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Well, if eternity is in the hearts of men, then men and women cannot disappear from existence. Questions or comments up to that point? I haven't, I haven't let you talk this morning. 
any, any thoughts that you have that come up that uh, you want to clarify? Anything at all? Okay, continuing. I'm getting blessed by this, and thank you for the opportunity again. The blessings of heaven. Number one, the first blessing is total satisfaction. C.S. Lewis put it well when he says, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that can't be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that never quite keep their promise. If I find in myself a desire in which no experience in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. Hey, that's neat, isn't it, eh? If there's something in me that longs for something that can't happen here, maybe, and he says it is, an indication that I was made for another world. And I like that. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards are known by everybody in this room. They are the original Rolling Stones, okay? Actually, they're coming to Vancouver, I think, next November. I, I don't think I'm going to get a ticket, but... Uh, <laughs> Mick Jagger and Keith Richards wrote the very famous song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, widely considered to be the most popular Rolling Stones song ever sung. It has been streamed more than 600 million times on Spotify and YouTube, show, showing how many people can relate to the message of this song, Can't Get No Satisfaction. Well, let's bring it down to reality. Can we get total satisfaction in this world? I don't even think so as Christians. Let me bring it down to a very, very basic level in Jim Richard's life. And I was thinking about this. You know, I told you that I love to travel. Well, why does traveling around the world, is it something that's still a core value to me in that, as I said, I've been around the world and already been to 23 countries. There's always a desire for more in terms of satisfaction. Total satisfaction in heaven. Number two, never-ending joy. Joy is one of the great things in this life, but it's not a never-ending thing in most circumstances. What, what is one of the experiences that you enjoy most in this life? Let's just have a, a few people respond to that. When, when I talk about a really cool, joyful experience to you, what, what first comes to mind for you? Just somebody. A number. Let's get some. Pardon me? Singing. Good. Good. Someone else. A joyful experience. Breathing. Okay. Someone else. Okay. Good. Yeah, meeting people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Joyful experience in this life. Friendship, Friendship. exactly. Okay, yes. Reading a good book. Catherine, my wife, is saying amen to that over here. Okay, right. Louise Penny, she's just reading now her newest book. Okay, some other, what joyful experience, something that really brings joy to you. Yes, seeing your grandchildren. Oh, that is fun. That's fun for Catherine and me. Other, other things, something really joyful that just really cranks you up. Getting a hug. Yes, yes, getting a hug. Very good. Well, for me, it is a wonderful Christmas day and the traditions associated with Christmas Day with the family, including Catherine's amazing fresh cinnamon buns on Christmas morning. Oh, I can smell them right now and taste them. Opening presents, a delectable dinner. But the common reality of all of the joyful experiences of life is that they all come to an end. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you this morning. <laughs> I'm not trying to be a Danny Downer. But all of our joyful experiences in this life come to an end. The wonderful Christmas dinner, the playtimes with the children or grandchildren, the trip to Hawaii, the experience of the sight of a great sunrise or sunset. 
There's a great quote by J.I. Packer, the former great theologian at Regent College here in Vancouver, and he says this, hearts on earth say in the course of a joyful event, I don't want this to ever end, but invariably it does. The hearts in heaven say, I want this to go on forever, and it will. There can be no better news than this. I love that. There can be no better news than this unending joy. And that is ours. Number three, no sickness, no sin, no death. And that is the wonderful prospect of heaven as well. Number four, perfect security is through an in eternal inheritance personally reserved for us. First Peter 1.4 says this, quote, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept or reserved in heaven for you. This is a wonderfully meaningful expression uh, that can never spoil f uh, or fade or perish because we live in the world in which a $100,000 inheritance promised to you by your parents 20 or 30 years ago unfortunately is not worth very much today. Okay, isn't that true? In a city with great inflation, in a country with great inflation, in a city where housing prices are gone through the roof, inheritances promised to us in the past, which were seen as hugely significant, shrink enormously in the world in which we live in because of the ravages of inflation and the uncertainty of the TSX. An inheritance reserved in heaven for you that will never fade, never diminish, or never lessen. Colossians 1.5, Paul speaks of, quote, the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. The hope that is stored up for you in heaven. This expression, stored up, <laughs> is a wonderful expression of the security of our heavenly inheritance. Stored up and reserved for you in heaven in heaven. I love this story talking about and demonstrating the idea of an inheritance stored up for you. Ever since he was a little boy, the boy's parents promised to give him a beautiful car, okay? They promised that ever since he was a little boy, that when he turned 16, he would be given a beautiful car. Well, this boy looked forward to parking it in the family's barn because they lived on a farm. And he would park it in the barn because there it would remain warm and dry and he was looking forward to that happening. But before giving their son this much desired car, the boy's parents had to get rid of an old junky car sitting under a tarp in the barn. Then one evening in early summer, the boy, now a teenager, heard strange sounds coming from the barn. It sounded like an engine. Well, later he walked into the barn and he saw the tarp. This old, ugly tarp rolled up against the door. He thought, quote, Dad is finally getting rid of that old, junky car. Then he looked and saw one of the most incredible sports cars in automobile history, a Corvette, but not any Corvette, a coveted 1963 classic Corvette 327 V8, and maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but that's a big engine, okay? Painted apple red. That was the car under the tarp all those years. He was stunned. It was always there just waiting for him to turn 16 so he could drive it. An inheritance far better than an apple red Corvette, which I would have loved but didn't get one. I did have a Camaro, however. And uh, better than a Corvette is the inheritance that is reserved for us in heaven. In the same way, the believer's magnificent heavenly inheritance is, quote, kept and reserved in heaven for you. 
unquote. Someday the Lord himself will roll up the tarp and let you experience it in your heavenly home of heaven. Well, here's, here's a question that is really important. And uh, it, it, it's one we need to answer. And I, 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 I like looking into this. And I don't, I'll tell you, I don't have all the answers. But a frequently asked question is this. When, when, when does the Christ follower actually experience the fullness of heaven? Do we go when we die to an intermediate state at the time of our death and then receive our resurrection body at the time of the rapture? Or do we immediately receive our resurrection body at the time of our death? Hmm. Uh, we're diving into relatively deep theology here, but it's important to dive into it, folks, because it's a very important question. When do we get our resurrection body? When do we fully experience all of heaven? Okay? I'm not going to go into really deep eschatology, but let me try to answer that for you. The answer for me that really helps me comes from Jesus' own words, and that's always a good place to start. Uh, two portions at the end of his life. In John 14, Jesus comforts his disciples just before his arrest and death. And in John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. With me me, okay? Hold on to those two words, with me. Then we get uh, Jesus' second portion of scripture, and it's on the cross just before he is about to die. After an excruciating crucifixion experience, Jesus says to the thief on the cross who has just experienced faith in him and has not anything and done anything to get any rewards, note that, uh, the thief on the cross who has just expressed faith in him, Luke 23, 43, today you will be with me in paradise. So the key words there in both verses are with me. The two words I've highlighted, with me, are the significant ones. And Dr. Rick Watts at a course at Regent College pointed this out in a class I was in with him. He said this, and this is really helpful to me. The most important thing for the believer is that at the time of our death, we are with Jesus, and that is all that matters. I don't know all the answer as to when we get our resurrection body. Maybe you do, but I don't know that. But the key and the important thing to me is at the time of my death as a believer in Jesus, as he promised to his disciples and to the thief on the cross, you will be with me. And folk, I can't emphasize that enough. The key thing is to be with Jesus. And all the other questions become secondary. And that just enormously, enormously helps me on this subject. Well, conclusion, let's try to wrap it up and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions, okay? Marco Polo was an amazing 13th century European adventurer. We, we, all, we all know about Marco Polo. He was an adventurer and explorer who, who went places where no other European had ever been or even dreamt of going. When he was just 17 years of age, imagine back to when you were 17, he embarked from his home in Venice, Italy on an epic journey that lasted for 25 years. Uh, that was quite a trip, wasn't it, eh? I've never been on a trip like that. He traveled from Italy to Russia, Afghanistan, Persia, over the Himalayan mountains to China. He was the first European to ever set foot and see China. In China, he was befriended by the most powerful ruler on earth at the time, Kublai Khan. His banquet hall could seat 6,000 people at one sitting, and they all ate off of plates of gold. That's pretty cool, isn't it? After 17 years of serving Kublai Khan, Marco Polo came back to Italy with gold, silk, and spices demonstrating the riches of the Orient that he had seen and experienced.
The people back home, however, totally dismissed his stories and said, Marco Polo, you're dreaming, you're making this up. And they dismissed China as simply a mythical place. Somewhere in your dreams, Marco, you didn't really experience this. His family priest rebuked him for bringing back these stories of, of, the, of the glory of China. On Marco Polo's deathbed, his final words were this. I have, not, I, have not, I have not only told you half of what I saw. In other words, folk, it's much, much better than what I told you. Well, in describing the blessings of glorification, in describing the blessings of heaven, 1 Corinthians 2.9 has the, the same message for every Christ follower, and it says this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. Nothing can actually allow us to totally conceive what God has prepared for us. And I say, amen, so be it, so be it.